welcome back to Health by Jessica. Today is the third and final part of a three-part series I have done with Tracy McBeath, who is a health coach and she also hosts the amazing podcast, The Nourish Mum Life Podcast. So check that out on iTunes, subscribe to her podcast as well and go check out her website. She has incredible work coming your way. She's got programs, um, she's got blogs, she's got client stories. So she's an awesome person to go and check out. But today in the third and final part of this series, we are talking about the role of stress and anxiety and cortisol in weight and health management. So this is a biggie um, and it's a really important conversation. Once again, just like part one and part two, we're not here to say, you know, our, it's our way or the highway or that what we're talking about here is the be all and end all for everybody. We really just wanted to have this discussion because both Tracy and myself see a lot of women and men who are highly stressed. And it's very common in this modern world to have so much stuff going on, to be so busy, to have cortisol levels through the roof and to be struggling with weight loss. And a lot of the time people are coming in and they're saying, you know, my energy levels are terrible. or They're all over the place. You know, they're really high when I'm about to go to bed, but they're really low when I'm waking up in the morning. Some people will say, you know, I'm hardly eating anything. I've cut my calories down and I can't cut them down anymore, but I'm gaining weight or I'm still not losing weight. And then other people will have things like digestive issues or depression or unbalanced mood or anxiety or heart palpitations things that you know they've gone to their usual doctor for and and cannot find a cause for and a lot of the time it just comes back to excessive incoming stresses on the body and we talk about in this conversation today how not to add more stresses to your body and to actually take the stresses away from your body and how this has a really beautiful flow on effect for your weight management and your health management. If you like the video today, please comment below, tell me what your favorite part was and subscribe to my channel. This is a new channel. And if you haven't watched part one and part two, please go and watch those. You really don't have to watch these in any particular order, but please enjoy and I look forward to seeing you soon. And how um, there is so much going on in our bodies that causes stress. Um, and just get people to understand a little bit about what are those symptoms? How, how do we know if our body is under too much stress? Um, you know, you talk about hormesis, which is that finding that right balance for you in terms of a stress. And of course, that's very individual because we all live different lives. Uh, we all have different metabolisms and all that sort of stuff. So what are some of the things uh, or some of the symptoms? I mean, I could sort of talk to you around the exercise side of things. I've seen throughout my personal training years so much chronic stress that comes back to too much exercise. But do you want to talk about in terms of um, maybe the dieting side of things? How do we know um, that our body is under too much stress? Yep. Um, so, I mean, there's so many different symptoms really. And some of them would include just your energy levels. So low energy or unbalanced energy. So some people get that surge of energy at nighttime when they're trying mm. to fall asleep and then they can't sleep very well. And then in the morning, they're sluggish and they're constantly fatigued throughout the day. And then at nighttime, again, energy goes up you know, that unbalanced energy, that's a sign that the body is not happy and mm -hmm. some things need to change and the hormones are imbalanced. And that's probably not a great time to stress your body out even more by doing things like fasting. You know, the body doesn't want all of these stresses. Fasting is a stress on the body. The ketogenic diet is a stress on the body. And so when people are experiencing poor sleep or a lack of energy, maybe that's not the best time to implement another stress. So that's one thing. Um, but also things like um, digestion. So someone with poor digestion, that is a sign that, the, or could be a sign that the gut is stressed and the gut is inflamed. 
So whether that be like diarrhea, whether that be bloating, constipation, just reflux, um, you know, there's many different digestive issues. And of course, we want to make sure that there's, you know, no, no chronic disease like celiac disease or Crohn's or something like that. But if that gets ruled out, you sort of get slapped this label of having IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. But that's not actually, that's, you only get diagnosed with IBS through a process of elimination. They don't really know what it is or what causes it. But a lot of research is, you know, linking the gut and the brain and showing that when the body is stressed, that can cause the gut to not function properly. And it's like that chicken or egg situation, you know, does an un, uh, unhappy gut cause an unhappy body or does the unhappy body cause the unhappy gut? You know, it's just, we, we may never get to the bottom of that. Mm -hmm. But I do see a lot of clients with digestive issues and with IBS that also have a lot of stresses going on. And if we can minimize those stresses and before we even get to the weight loss, because again, they may want to lose weight, we need to minimize the stresses first and then we can address the weight loss. Mm, so that's absolutely. another one. Yep. Um, and also skin conditions as well, like breaking out, you know, acne or even dry skin um, or just, you know, being all over the place with your skin, sometimes breaking out, sometimes being dry skin that's peeling as well and things like dermatitis, like inflammatory skin conditions. Um, anything that ends with like an itis is inflammation, you know, so osteoarthritis, you know, there's all these things. Mm -hmm. And all of that comes back to inflammation in the body and stress in the body. Stress and inflammation is, is the same thing to your cells. So your body adapts to that stress and it adapts to that inflammation. And that adaptation process is all of these diseases and conditions we're so familiar with today. Mm. So, you know, it, it, we hear it all the time. It's quite amazing how when people change their diet and they change their lifestyle, you know, all of these inflammatory conditions seem to just disappear, like arthritis and their IBS and, and even their depression. You know, these things get lifted. And it's because the lifestyle that they've, they've moved to is one that isn't giving their body so much stress and one that's been able to calm the inflammation and it's just allowed everything to function more optimally. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I would just add in terms of, you know, exercise, it is such a, you know, thing out there that more is better and to push harder and harder and harder. But, you know, I've seen people constantly, they look great, they're fit, but they're constantly sick they don't, um, they get injuries really easily. You know, I think they're sort of really big signs that, you know, you are probably doing too much with exercise. And, you know, the more and uh, the older I get, I guess, and the more I've looked into it, you know, less, it doesn't have to be more. I mean, you can be really smart around what you do. You don't have to train every day. You don't have to push yourself for hours, you know, at the gym or on the treadmill. Um, yeah, I think it's the same thing. Is it something that you can sustain forever? Because ideally, we want to be able to move in some capacity forever. Um, yeah, it's it's really interesting. And I, I, I would add to um, what I see a lot is a really constant level of anxiety going on. Um, and yes, I've had clients that have done really well with the sort of the food side of things and changed things, but they haven't really changed what's going on up there. It hasn't really sort of helped them yet until we've looked at things around their thinking and all that sort of stuff and the habitual thought patterns and all that sort of thing to really help reduce the anxiety because it's just such a thing. There's so We're so busy. There's so much on. There's always so much, so much on our mind. But, you know, people, I think, don't realise that we have any control over that, that we just have to accept it. But you can sort of take a step back and change the way you see things to help reduce a lot of that sort of stuff. So that's something I've seen as well. But overall, I mean, it's so important that we have to find that right balance for us in mm. that stress. Yeah. Yeah. I love that you brought up anxiety because, mm. you know, it's, I think a lot of people will just say it like, oh, I've got anxiety. Like it's such a common thing, but it, it shouldn't be just because it's common. It doesn't mean that it's not normal. 
And, you know, my clients often say it to me, like just a throwaway line or like, oh, yeah, I'm on anti-anxieties or antidepressants. And it's just like, oh, do you, you know, should we, should we explore the role of nutrition in those areas? Because, you know, nutrition does play a role and it's not to say that it's the, the source or the cause of the anxiety or the depression, but, you know, poor nutrition or poor nutritional status, poor food choices can absolutely amplify anxiety and depression. I mean, if we just take the blood sugar roller coaster as an example, if your blood sugars are crashing down a couple of hours after a high carbohydrate meal and you're feeling that irritability, you're starting to get, you know, that shakiness, your mood's changing, your hunger levels are going up, that's going to amplify any feelings of anxiety you had. And if you're not able to or you, you haven't got the knowledge or the education or the support to be able to link that to your food intake because most of us don't we're taught mm. not to link that sort of thing to our food intake we're just thought to to blame ourselves and internalize it mm. but if you're not able to link it you start thinking what's wrong with me mm. like why do i have this anxiety and you, you think you just need to dampen it with a pill or a tablet but maybe your diet is contributing to it. Maybe your exercise is contributing to it, your lifestyle or, or whatever it is. And maybe we can rejig those dietary factors for you to help your body be in this better state, to be able to better manage stresses and better manage anxiety and better manage times of low mood so that you don't fall into these chronic states of depression or chronic mental health issues mm. that you know, when you're stuck in them, it's, it seems like there's no way out. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's terrible how common these things are today. Um, but I, I really, I really do welcome more research in this area, linking nutrition and mental health, mm. because I really do think there are some valid links. Mm. And, you know, we do know one of the major links we do know about is the link between vitamin D and depression. Mm. And a lot of it, a lot of it is associational data where they've just found that people who have clinical depression are more likely to be vitamin D deficient. People who don't have depression are, are less likely to be vitamin D deficient and have higher levels of vitamin D. And there's a strong correlation there. And the same thing with long chain omega-3 fatty acids. Um, you know, low levels of long chain omega-3 fatty acids in the diet is associated with increased risk of depression and anxiety. So, you know, if my clients share with me that they're dealing with any of that, I always make sure they're fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, which is so important for cognition, are nice and full in their diet. And I talk to people about the foods that have vitamins A, D, E, and K, because mm -hmm. um, they're healthy sources of fats and proteins, like we were speaking about earlier. And then also the long chain omega-3 fats, which, you know, I, I think a lot of us are actually not getting enough of those marine sources of fat from fish and seafood and seaweed. And I think just opening up the conversation about, hey, you know, we don't know for sure that changing your diet is going to help with any of this. But there's some strong, strong suggestions and some strong reasons as to why it may help and it may contribute to positive health outcomes for you. So mm. let's try it. Let's explore those together and let's try it. Mm. And I think that's a nice way of putting it as opposed to saying, you know, this is definitely going to help with your mood. This is definitely going to help with your weight loss. No, we don't know because everybody's mm -hmm. different. We genuinely mm -hmm. don't know, but we can help guide people in the right direction. Mm. Fantastic. Fantastic. Just a little bit on cortisol, helping people sort of understand that in terms of stress, because we know obviously what we take in, you know, the fight or flight response that goes on in our body, you know, when we're under stress. Obviously, that's come about from our evolution. If we saw the bear, we had to run. And even today, we still have to run if we're going to be hit by a bus or, you know, we've got to get that that uh, cortisol going to get the blood sugars into our blood to help us move. But I think a lot of people don't realise too that that can also just simply come from our thoughts as we talked about, you know, with anxiety and things like that. So um, one of the things that we touched on too around intermittent fasting is that it is a stressor on the body. So if you are thinking, because it is so common out there and of course it's one of the tools and it's a fantastic toolkit if and when your body is ready for it, uh, but it doesn't 
decrease your cortisol. It only helps lower insulin when you're fasting. So if you've still got a lot of stresses, you've got a lot of cortisol going on, you are going to have high insulin, aren't you? Do you, can you explain that in a little bit better terms than me in terms of that scientific understanding around cortisol? Yeah, I mean, it's it's very confusing because you know, we'd, we, we've sort of, we had this really natural cortisol response when we were waking up with the sun and we were going to bed when the sun went down and we didn't have all the stresses of the modern world. We didn't have to work nine till five. We didn't have family stresses, you know, life was a bit more simple. And we don't live in that modern, that, that world anymore. We live in the modern world. And so as much as we would like, you know, cortisol not to be an issue because you're right, cortisol does increase blood sugars and that can increase insulin and that can lead to weight gain and poor health and things like that. Um, we do have to just manage it often. And, you know, we do have to just harness what we can harness. So what is in our control and what is in our power to help balance out cortisol? I don't think we're ever going to get perfect cortisol responses like we probably should and what probably will be best for our body because I just don't think it's possible in this world unless we're completely off the grid <laughs> which some of us are but you know most of us are not and you know, there's lots of different ways to look at it but I think that you, you did summarize it quite well you know our body does it can create its own glucose and its own energy and if we take that morning waking time when we wake up in the morning we're waking up because of a cortisol response so our body's releasing that cortisol waking us up and that's a healthy cortisol yeah. response you know we want to wake up for the day that's completely normal um but what we're often seeing is because we have all of these stresses piling up people's morning cortisol response is shooting way too high. So the morning blood sugars is what we call the often the dawn phenomenon is is going too high and that's requiring a huge amount of insulin to just help balance out the response from the cortisol. Mm -hmm. Now that's definitely not conducive to good health or losing weight. You know, that's something that is a really big sign. The body is under a lot of stress and there's a lot of insulin resistance going on because we should have a cortisol response to wake us up in the morning, but our body should be able to clear that blood sugar pretty damn, damn quickly. Mm. And, you know, a lot of people who are intermittent fasting, they're actually not helping the body because they're adding that extra stress in the morning you know, if they are already experiencing those high blood sugars, high cortisol in the morning, they're already under stress. And then they're adding on food restriction, calorie restriction in that morning period, their cortisol can just go up, 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 you know, and their body needs to release more and more insulin in that morning period where they're trying to fast, you know, they're trying to fast and they're trying to lose weight and it could be counterintuitive. Mm. And what I like to do with some clients who I really think are, are doing well but they're still experiencing that sort of struggle with their weight loss and they are engaging in intermittent fasting because for a lot of people it's easy and they like doing it and it is a good strategy you know it's very easy to just get up and go to work as opposed to not having to spend time making your brekkie or whatever it is so a lot of people like it from a practical sense but when i'm thinking maybe it's not the right time for them to do it I will generally ask them to wear a continuous blood glucose monitor or, you know, test their blood sugars or something to track their morning cortisol response. How is that actually affecting your blood sugars? And if your blood sugars are increasing and they are going higher than they should for longer than they should in the morning, maybe that's a sign that we should stop, give intermittent fasting a break or mm. only do it on some days, just not mm. every day. Yeah. Because having brekkie in the morning, and when I say brekkie, we're not talking about cereal and low-fat milk. We're talking about eggs. We're talking about smoked salmon, you know, the protein-based meal in the morning with some healthy fats. That is a really good way of helping your body reduce its cortisol levels in the morning. Mm. So instead of cortisol just going up, 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 you can actually help to blunt the cortisol response in the morning. Mm. And again... Mm. That's one people struggle to get their head around 
because you know they've often done low carb and then they've moved on to intermittent fasting and it's exactly what you said before more is not necessarily better and for a lot of people intermittent fasting is amazing but if we've got a lot of stresses going on and it's happened to me before you know i've just been implementing everything intermittent fasting ketogenic diet all these things that you know i thought were positive stresses for me but because i had all these external stresses going on in my life at that time it actually became too much and i had to take away the intermittent fasting for a period of time and reintroduce three meals a day with snacks sometimes and i was choosing the right types of foods but it was just helping my body say okay all right you know we're not in that stress state we're not in we you know we don't need to send cortisol through the roof um, because we really do want to aim for cortisol that's pulsatile we don't want cortisol going up in the morning and and staying high Mm, yeah. Did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. I think it just, again, it takes it back to it's very individual. You can't just copy what everybody else is doing or what somebody else is doing. You have to make it work for you, but see the big picture. It's not, you know, all these tools can work at the right time for you, but you have to you know, you have to wait till the, when that right time might be. And yeah, I'd, just because I say, you know, it's, there's so much stress going on and just, you know, it's certainly something that I never recommend early. You know, it, it's like, I think you said it in the beginning, if your body's going to do it, it will kind of naturally lead itself into that. But I think pushing through hunger, um, you know, when your body is under a lot of stress is probably not conducive to the outcomes that you're looking for. And yeah. Yeah, because hunger is a sign mm. that your body is stressed mm. and your body doesn't have 24 hour a day access to your body fat. So even if you do have low insulin levels and even if you have taught your body to burn fat for fuel, you know, fantastic. But it doesn't mean your body can consistently use that fat all the time. And that comes back to our stresses and things like that again, you know, things that are increasing cortisol or insulin or whatever it is. And just the fact that the body doesn't constantly want to be in that energy out. So mm. that homeostasis comes back into play. Mm. So, you know, if it happens that you're listening to your hunger and satiety and you're feeling good, your energy levels are high, you're not feeling hungry, you can go about your your usual tasks and, and your mental clarity is there, then go for it, you know, fast. But just stay in tune with your body, stay in tune with your energy. And it may be that you fast for 10 hours, you know, fantastic. But if you start getting hungry or your energy dips or you just don't feel so good anymore, mm. have a meal and, and don't beat yourself up about it and don't worry about what time it is. Just have mm. a meal. You know, you did great. Yeah. You know, far, yeah. 10 hour fast, fantastic. And then you'll just keep going with that pattern. And maybe the next time you do it, it'll be a 24 hour fast. Yeah. And maybe the next time, you know, a 48 hour fast. But then you may also have periods of the year where you're not fasting because your body's sending you more of those hunger signals. You know, mm. you may have started a new job at work or something like that. You know, mm. you may have just had a child or something like that. You know, these different life stages where your body wants more energy to come in through food. Yeah. I mean, energy density in food is a fantastic thing. Mm. You know, that's the fuel we're putting in our body to fuel ourselves and to give us energy and to to build us up, to, you know, to create our building blocks of our body that make us us, mm. you know, we don't want to just keep restricting it. And, you know, there's times of the year where restriction, great, fantastic. There's times of the day where restriction is fantastic. I mean, we shouldn't be eating while we're sleeping, for example. That's a great way to fast, just go to sleep, you mm. know? Mm. That's but right. we don't have to put too much rules and regulations on ourselves and, I fear that that's what's happening to, to some people, you know, no matter what dietary pattern they're following, they still want to give themselves more rules and more restrictions. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think if it causes anxiety, it's probably going to be undoing the benefit that you're hoping for anyway. So I love that. Well, yeah, it's important. I think, you know, if you want to do something like fasting, why are you doing it? Think about what it is you're hoping to achieve out of it and yeah. Um, and just going back to what you said, you know, when your body is hu hungry, it's important to eat because it's after some fuel. Um, but conversely, as we said too, you know, a sign of it not being hungry is a hormone, could be hormonal imbalance too. So 
it's it's just a very <laughs> it's, it's, it's difficult isn't it <laughs> <laughs> well that's it and that's why you know none of us have the answers like coming back to what we said before you know everybody is different and finding a practitioner whether it's a health coach or a dietitian or somebody that you know you feel comfortable communicating with and you resonate with and who understands your health history and your goals and where you're at at the moment and talks to you about your stresses you know your your practitioner your your coach that you're working with they should be talking to you about the stresses what stage of life are you in what are your stresses like what what is everything else that's going on and that person will help guide you through it and I think anytime you're working with someone and you know they don't even ask you you know who do you live with at home do you have children you know what's your work stress like how much are you exercising like if you're not getting that that sort of information across and you're not transferring that to your health professional how can they really help you, you know? And if they're, if they're not familiar with what that means in terms of your metabolism and your health, then maybe you need to find somebody else to help you through it because it's, it's really confusing. It's hard. It's hard to find what works for you, particularly in this modern world where we've got all these messages. And, you know,